Let's talk about behaviorism. Part two. Skinner used animals, predominantly rats and pigeons, to conduct his experiments. In one of his first experiments, he placed rats in a box with a feeding tube connected to a lever. Once the rats realized that every time they pressed a the lever they got food, Skinner noticed that the rats spent a great deal of time pressing the lever. Skinner had actually trained the rats to press the lever by using positive reinforcement. By giving the rats food every time they pressed the lever, the likelihood of that behavior increased. Aside from positive reinforcement, there are other ways to increase and decrease the likelihood of behaviors. Negative reinforcement occurs when a negative consequence occurs in order to increase the likelihood of a behavior. If Skinner wanted to use negative reinforcement to make the rats press the lever, he might send an electric shock through the box until the rat pressed the lever. Although this would be an ethically questionable method of reinforcement, the rat's behavior would increase due to its desire to make the negative consequence stop. On the other hand, punishment is used to decrease a behavior. When your mom makes you do chores when you don't do your homework, this is called positive punishment. Because the punishment is added or given to you, it is considered positive. If, as a punishment for not finishing your homework, your mom takes away your phone, th that is considered a negative punishment. It's negative because something was taken away in order to de decrease a behavior. Another hallmark of operant conditioning is shaping, or successive approximation. When Skinner's rats were learning to press the lever, they did not immediately understand that the lever was the source of their food. Instead, Skinner rewarded the rats with food every time they got close to the lever, then every time the rats got closer to the lever and reached up, and then eventually the rats pulled the lever themselves and were rewarded by the food coming down the tube. This process of shaping gradually leads to the individual completing the desired behavior. Skinner also pioneered the concept of schedules of reinforcement. When we talk about schedules of reinforcement, Ratio means behavior, as in how many times the individual must respond with the desired behavior in order to get a reinforcement. Interval means time, as in how long the individual must wait between reinforcement. Imagine a vending machine. Typically, a vending machine will give a reward every time the hungry customer elicits the desired behavior by putting money in the machine. This is called continuous reinforcement. The customer only needs to respond once in order to be rewarded, and they're going to be rewarded every single time. What if we changed the schedule of reinforcement? If the vending machine had fixed ratio reinforcement, it would give a candy bar after a fixed number of payments, such as every five quarters put in. Every five times the customer shows the desired behavior, he is reinforced. The machine may also operate on a fixed interval schedule, meaning it will dispense a candy bar after a certain amount of time, let's say every minute, as long as a quarter has been put in. The customer is rewarded after one minute passes as long as he shows the desired behavior at least once during that time. If our friend comes upon a machine that uses variable ratio reinforcement, there won't be a number of quarters that will consistently give him his snack. The first reinforcement may require three quarters, but the next one might not come until he puts it's in eight. The number of responses required for a reward is unpredictable. The same goes for variable interval reinforcement, when no matter how many quarters he puts in, the man will not get a candy bar until a certain amount of time passes, but this time the time will be different every time he puts in a quarter. For example, the first time he puts in a quarter, it may take 20 seconds for the candy bar to be dispensed, but the second time it might take up to five hours. Examples of schedules of reinforcement can be seen all around you. If you have a quiz given on a fixed interval schedule, it means you're guaranteed to have a quiz, say, every seven days. Things like gambling and fishing are on variable ratio schedules, which is why these activities are so popular. You never know which hand of cards or which cast off will bring you a reward. If you independently sell your mixtape online and you get $50 one week, but $1,000 from the next week's sales, that's an example of variable interval reinforcement. Today we talked about three very influential men in the world of behaviorism, Ivan Pavlov, John B. Watson, and B.F. Skinner. They were all integral in inspiring and reiterating these basic concepts of behaviorism. Using observation and empirical evidence, behaviorism sees psychology as a science. Behavior is the result of a stimulus. Something must motivate us to act the way we do. A person's environment determines the way that they act and ultimately directs their development. Given this theory, humans and animals learn in very similar ways, and they can be controlled using the environment. A person's behavior can be altered by learning processes such as classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Remember that behaviorism is just a theory, but it's a theory that shaped the way that psychologists view their field. Free.
created using Powtoon.